Perfect. Let's okay. start, guys. I think Crystal, I think it's going to yeah. start. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, press enter again for the title. OK, so um, our, as you know, uh, lead journal discussion article is the impact of electronic media violence. Um, so beginning in the 20th and 21st century, our social environment changed drastically. So technology became more adma uh, advanced and mass media became a part of our daily lives. Um, people are glued to their phones, they eat with their phones, they sleep with their phones. There's almost no or very little separation between human beings and technology. Um, of course, there's certain positives to having technology. Uh, we can electronically send and receive imperative documents. We can have virtual classes during uh, pandemics as we are now. Um, we can track keep and uh, use it for work-related purposes. However, media violence can have an impact, you know, detrimentally over the use well-being. So research evidence has expanded over the past century to expose the effects that violence has on uh, TV, films, and video games. Similarly to growing up in violent households or uh, you know, uh, high crime rated neighborhoods or having bad influences and in peers. So now I feel like it's harder to keep children away from exposed violence because there's new avenues that are open to the youth with almost no limitations at all. So of course parents can monitor or set boundaries to how much time is spent for media, but and overbearing, overbearing a child or hovering can push the child further to explore media violence. In fact, now that cell phones are widely available, we can almost watch or search nearly anything. Uh, Next slide. Okay. So here are the researcher terms. The first is aggressive behavior. And I put researcher terms because this is the way that researchers define these terms. Uh, it is the purposeful act to harm. I'm sorry, this is like in the way. Yeah, while recording, the, the mouse is somehow. Yeah, I can. Yeah. You just need to be persistently pressing <laughs> to go to the next slide. <laughs> but it's Jason, right? It's Kevin who's controlling the yep. slide. Yeah. So Kevin has to press for you. Mm, you no, Is it working? Um, no, it? it just, it's the, where it's showing everybody's, uh, it's showing, you know, everyone's, everyone in the class and it's like blocking the slide. Oh, you don't see the slide? All you have to do is just minimize it, honestly. I do the Let me I try to do this. Okay. Okay, uh, all right. Let's... Okay, so aggressive behavior is described as the purposeful act to harm or annoy another, which is, you know, becoming very irritable to another. It can be both physical or non-physical and media violence is described as visual displays of physical aggressive acts by one being or a character against another. Of course, um, the meanings of media violence can be subjective based on the perceptions of individualized people, but overall people may not realize what constitutes aggressive behavior. So in general for um, non-physical aggressive behavior that would be spreading rumors or having insults and but what the researchers are focusing on is 
uh, strictly physical behavior. So of course that's hitting, shoving, uh, gravely bodily harm, or even homicide. Next slide, Kev. So understanding how and why media violence affects the youth. So research shows that a large quantity of aggressive children are likely to grow up to be aggressive adults and that gravely violent adolescents and adults were extremely aggressive and or violent as children. Therefore, the most effective predictor of violent behavior in older adolescents and young or middle aged adults is aggressive behavior when younger. Now keep in mind that majority of youth who engage in some type of antisocial behavior and who are aggressive don't automatically or certainly become violent teenager or adults. That's because there has to be several factors present collectively over this course of time to contribute to aggressive behavior. Next slide. So these are the theoretical explanations. The researchers are saying that there's both short-term and long-term effects when being exposed to uh, media violence for children. Um, here, of course, you see priming. Of course, it's like, uh, it's an observed stimulus, so it excites another brain node and essentially can be linked to cognit cognitation. So an example is seeing a gun and it links to ideas of aggression. Therefore, when uh, media violence primes aggressive ideas, aggression is more likely to occur. For the second of arousal, basically uh, right after watching an exciting media presentation, the transfer could cause more aggressive responses to urging or agitation. So um, social problem solving can become displaced if arousal re uh, reaches a peak and diminishes inappropriate actions, reactions. Uh, the last would be uh, mimicry. So when children behave exactly as what's shown or expressed, children are like sponges. So therefore they reference social scripts which is used to increase their learning capabilities on how to behave and think. So uh, an example is a younger sibling who mimics the actions of their older sibling. Uh, for long-term effects, observ observational learning, it's basically like uh, encoding in memory social scripts to guide or lead behavior through family, peers, community, and the media. Um, and desensitization, it's basically another word as explained in the book in chapter 10 as tolerance. So you basically build up more tolerance for negativity and therefore you become less sensitive. So which of course means less empathetic. Uh, and then we have an active learning which is like uh, when players of a violent video game, they both observe and participate actively in the violent actions. So um, they're of course less emotionally affected as well. Uh, seeing you know, more violence becomes the norm and they have a lack of concern for others meaning they have a slower reaction time. So for instance, watching a fight, it may take longer to, or may not at all actually uh, break up the fight or care that someone's hurt or injured. So on page uh, 222 of chapter 10 in our book for Born for Love, they actually did a study, a longitudinal study of 329 participants over the course of 15 years. Um, they found that 11% of men were convicted of crimes. And these are for people who watch uh, explicit violence on television. And these men were also twice as likely to push, shove, or grab their wife. So basically domestic violence. Um, in comparison with women, women were actually four times 
as likely to punch, choke, or beat an adult. So this will be an example of like a long-term effect. Next slide. Yep. Now these are statistics based on empirical studies. Um, keep in mind that these statistics are based on TV, movies, and video games, not just video games in general. So the first is children in the US spend an average between three to four hours per day watching TV. Um, the best studies reveal that more than 60% of programs contain violence and 40% of those same programs contain explicit violence. So 60% is more than half and 40% is close to half. So that's a lot of violence that's being displayed in these programs. Um, as of now, video games are presented in 83% of homes with children. So that's almost all homes. Um, in 2004, 52% of children aged 8 to 18 played video games. Uh, video game usage peaks during middle childhood between 8 and 10 years old from 69 minutes daily and declines to 33 minutes per day during adolescence, which is 15 through 18 years. Um, I believe that it peaks during middle uh, uh, childhood because and declines during adolescence. Um, <clears throat> because I feel like adolescents have more freedom to, let's say, experiment with other activities than uh, middle child children do. So being that, that there's restrictions when you're in middle childhood, I feel like you have lesser options as to what activities to engage in, which is why uh, more middle-aged children play video games as compared to adolescents. Adolescents are doing other things, they may be more uh, invested in their academics, sports, um, even risky behaviors like smoking, drinking, sex exploration, etc. So that's why I believe the decline occurs uh, during adolescence in comparison to middle childhood. Um, does this mean that media violence has a smaller effect on teens than in children? And that's actually a reference that I found. So basically, yes, children are more impressionable and gullible and um, teens uh, think more abstractly. However, teens feel greater pressures that involves more serious decision-making compared to uh, children. And uh, they also have more freedom to, of their actions. So I found an article, which is the one referenced here, on violence in media and what effects it has on behavior. And I actually discovered a report from 2002 um, by the US Secret Service and US Department of Education. It was between the years of 1974 to 2000, where they actually studied 37 incidents of targeted school shootings and school attacks. Now in this study, uh, they found that the school shooters demonstrated high interest in violence through movies, video games, media, and even books. So, but again, we have to remember and keep in mind that a healthy, well-adjusted human being with very little to no risk factors is not going to become a school shooter just because they play Call of Duty. So other risks, can range from prior fright fights, as in plural, not singular, um, having biases towards hostility, low parental involvement, physical victimization, bullying others, living in poverty, stress, uh, neglect, or social isolation. Next slide. This next one's done, I believe. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So it's, it's pretty much common knowledge at this point that when you expose like younger children to like any sort of violent like media, they'll, they'll mimic what they see. Um, so when it comes to like conducting experiments regarding the effects of violent media on like children or just anyone in particular, um, what researchers would often do is like after they expose the um, experimental group to, you know, like a violent film or violent video game, they ask them to like partake in activities or, you know, or games like hockey and stuff like that, that 
something that will like easily provoke them to be like aggressive. So in the article, it mentions one one of the experiments mentions them having the participants play hockey, and it, this it doesn't always have to be hockey; it could be anything competitive. Um, so I'm gonna talk in more detail about the experiments mentioned. Uh, let's see. So all the all the experiments mentioned in the articles are pretty much the same experiment. The only difference is uh, the participants like age range. So the first one that was mentioned was uh, an experiment conducted on seven to nine year olds, close to like 400 uh, boys. So what the researchers had them do was sit down and watch a violent film. The control group watched a nonviolent film. And afterwards they had both groups like come together to play hockey and they had an observer who didn't know anything about like them watching a movie or anything, um, observed them and like rate which boy, like which, which group was like being the most aggressive. And the observer picked the experimental group, of course. Um, and what they did on top of like showing them uh, a violent film, they had the referee for the game uh, usually carry uh, some sort of like object that remind that would uh, be a reference to the movie they just watched. And what they found was uh, boys who like had that referee, like no matter what, if they watched the violent film and then had that referee, they were like extremely like aggressive towards uh, the other kids. The second experiment, uh, they showed preschoolers like a violent video or something. Um, and what they found was like almost immediately, like after watching the violent like video, uh, the preschoolers would like be more likely to like phys physically attack like other kids. Uh, they didn't explain explain like to what extent, like if it was just like you know small things or like pretty big things. Um, the third experiment was they used delinquents. Um, so they had the so what they found was uh, on days that like these delinquents would like go out and watch like a violent film they were way more likely to uh, get into fight that day than like any other normal day where they didn't watch the film. Uh, so fourth experiment, okay. Uh, so they conducted this experiment on male and female college students, and what they uh, did was had. The, college, uh, the participants play like a very violent like video game. Uh, they didn't specify what game in particular. Um, and afterwards, they got everyone together and had them. Uh, they had them all play like a game, not like a video game or anything, um, where the loser would have to let you know the winner would like choose the punishment for the loser and stuff like that. And what they found was people who played who were playing the violent game would often deliver like more intense uh, pun punishments to like the losing side. Okay. Okay. So this one experiment in particular is often cited by like video game um, companies when it comes to like uh, the effects of violent video games on like people. Uh, so this experiment was conducted by William and Squirk uh, they had uh, participants. Uh, it's important to note that they were adults um, playing a cooperative online like video game. And the results of the study they they stated uh, they didn't have any like long term effects that were like and noteworthy or any like short term effects. But the the studies like kind of looked at as like not valid because of a few few reasons um because william and Squirek chose like a biased sample uh they didn't really have a good uh control group to base off to like compare the experimental group with and they didn't really have like good a good set of like behavioral like measures and stuff observational studies. Um, so, so all the studies I mentioned before were like lab experiments and they had, you know, with lab experiments, they have like a lot of control with how uh, everything goes. 
Uh, so these next studies are kind of like observation on longitudinal studies. Um, what they tend to fa find was uh, observational studies weren't, they weren't able to produce like strong, similarly like strong results to like lab experiments, but the results were still like strong enough to be like generalize like the, uh, the public. Um, you know, let's see. So let's see. Something, something that they mentioned was that, you know, ob observational studies are very easily like repl replicable. Longitudinal studies. Okay. Uh, so, according to like these studies, uh, early and repeated expo exposure to like violent media. It's also important to mention that if it's left like unchecked, like if you allow the your these like children to like continue to mimic what they see, um, it can predict like later on in life the child's going to become like very very aggressive. Like the older they get, the more aggressive they get. And um, they were able to predict this level of, of like aggressiveness from like one to three, then 15 and 20, 22 years later. They also state that if there is an intervention at like a young age or you like, you know, you tell them like, don't mimic everything you see, um, then aggressive behavior from childhood doesn't always like uh, predict aggression in like adulthood. So, I think Crystal mentioned this. So one study did like a 15 year follow-up with a number of children who watched like a lot of violent media. Um, it's important to note that they identified with like the aggressors in, in like these films or television shows. And what, so all these children were like in the middle childhood by the way. And what they found similar to what Crystal said, um, they were more likely to have committed like crimes and other assaults. So, they were more likely to have been arrested for committing crimes. Uh, they've been, they were more likely to like push or throw something at their spouse or like shove or physically assault someone when they're angered. So like choking, stuff like that. Crystal, is this? Right, yeah. So these are examples and moderators. So I have a film example, Kill Bill. Um, which is one of my faves. So the effects of media violence on children are moderated by situational uh, characteristics, as supposed to be characteristics, of the presentation. Examples are aggressive uh, predispositions, personal traits, how well material attracts and sustains the attention. For the second, I have a TV series example, which is Dexter. Um, the viewer characteristics depend on perceptions of the plot, viewers who view the violence as life in reality and who identify with the perpetrator inflicting the violence. For the third, I have an example of uh, video game violence, Grand Theft Auto. So the plot characteristics to consider, such as portrayals of justified violent behavior and showing rewards instead of punishment or consequences for wrongdoing. In this case, Grand Theft Auto, when you complete missions that involve death um, or killing, you do get rewarded and you're not punished. Um, of course, the police officers do go after you, but you can have like shootouts with them. And it's really, it's really, as far as video games, they have adapted to where they're more real. As you can see in the picture, the, the gentleman looks like a regular guy. <laughs> um, they're moving more in further. York, right? you yeah, saw like that's <laughs> in the middle of the street. Um, so yeah, they're they're less fictionist. They're using less fictionist characters, and they're making it more real. So of course, young children playing this are gonna relate to it more or link it to reality in a sense, to where they're unable to separate fiction from reality because of what they're seeing in, for example, this video game here. The people look more realistic, and the effects are are way better than they were long ago for video games and even television. So um, I do also want to link this to chapter 10, page 223, in how it discusses that educational programs for young children also show aggression. Now, of course, it's not done purposely, and it's not showing physical aggression, but there is verbal aggression. So for example, 
they can show in verbal outbursts or explosion during a climax of a proposed issue. Um, and this often confuses children on how to effectively and properly communicate through social problems. Instead of expressing themselves calmly, they're, uh, you know, shouting and uh, bursting out how they, you know, verbally how they feel, but not collectively or calmly as they should. Um, so also we see through extensive TV watching that it affected Brandon. So he watched uh, between eight to 12 hours a day or more as stated on page 220. Uh, and it had hindered his ability to attach and connect. So because he was watching the uh, TV since infancy, uh, he actually used his mirror neurons as we um, previously learned about with baby Sophia um, to mimic conversations and language and movements that were seen on TV instead of uh, through real life social bonding. So as they explain, he moved more robotically and he was less empathetic. He was more withdrawn. He lost facial expressions. He didn't understand the social cues, which are very important when you're communicating with someone, or how to properly use language when you're communicating with someone. Next slide. So now we have opposing views. There were some researchers that felt differently. Now, one of the opposing views was that uh, researchers say that youth who are already aggressive are the ones who are particularly drawn to violent uh, electronic content. And the second is some argue that video violence substitutes for real world violence. This means that people can act as a positive force and release anger harmlessly in a video game. Example is pretending a character is the desired enemy, uh, enemy sorry, in real life. So, so of course, research proves that this is partly true. However, it does vary by individual cases. And of course, uh, aggressive children are negatively affected by video violent exposure, but watching video violence can make them even more violent than they were previously. So uh, for the second bullet, research finds that anger management therapies, such as uh, you know, hitting a pillow or taking out your anger on a false figure, um, not in a video game, in a real life uh, anger management therapy session, to uh, actually increases rage instead of uh, releases it. So therefore, anger won't stop because the brain becomes what it does, which was a quote that I loved um, from the book. Next slide. Okay. All right, so this is a uh, bar graph that I actually um, copied from the Lee Journal article. It was at the end at, uh, in the summary section. So basically this is the graph based on Bushman and Hughesman report. And it basically asks, tries to ask the question if media violence is considered a public health threat. <clears throat> so as you can see, um, letter A will be smoking and lung cancer, B will be media and uh, violence exposure and so forth going up to J. But as you can see, they did actually consider media violence a public health threat because um, compared to the other common threats listed here, it was the second highest. The only thing higher than uh, media violence was smoking and lung cancer. So uh, even though these are relatively small percentages, it does, we do have to take into consideration that it's just as high, if not higher, than other common public health threats, which is why they consider it so. Next slide. 
So I actually took the liberty of doing my own personal study with my daughter. Don't judge me as a parent. Um, <laughs> it was just for the, just to, um, to see if this would work. But uh, anyway, she's female, she's eight. Uh, I allowed her to play one hour a day of video game playing over the course of four weeks in which I observed her behaviors to see if it will have an effect. Um, her game of choice was Grand Theft Auto, just in, 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 due to her curiosity compared to other uh, violent video games that I dis uh, displayed to her as an option, mm -hmm. such as Resident Evil, Mortal Kombat, and Call of Duty. Um, this is just so you know a little bit of her before playing, um, just her personality traits. She's shy at first, but she's very talkative, kind-hearted, creative, energetic, funny, and sensitive. So her effects after the observation, she displayed short-term effects. Now, keep in mind, she doesn't have any other um, high risk factors um, to combine to playing video games, but she still showed short-term effects related to uh, mimicry and priming. So basically, I'm going to give you an example. She had um, verbal inappropriate suggestions, mm -hmm. although she did not show any uh, physical aggression. So, um, her first, for my first example, I have that she had um, like very heightened impatience. Um, she asked if we can run the red light in order to reach our destination, um, or if we can drive on the sidewalk where pedestrians were seen in order to avoid traffic. So she had an increased level of frustration. Of course, in the game, you're able to do that. Um, and you don't have to even play attend, uh, abide by any traffic you know, uh, traffic rules and guidelines and so forth. So when we were in the vehicle, she did want to just, well, suggested just running over people to get to where we would go. Um, of course, um, after a very uh, intensive conversation, she understood, you know, the difference. But again, this is just an example of how it can affect children or confused children. So um, she was able to realize that she, what she can do on screen is what she cannot do in real life settings. Um, I was glad that the course of four weeks was over. <laughs> that I was really shocked by her asking that. So um, after the discussion, she was immediately brought back to, um, you know, uh, reality. Next slide. Uh, so to talk about the moderators of media of violence, um, to like, I guess, to recap of what's going on, not everyone exposed to media violence reacts equally when they're exposed to basically what they watch. They have to make a connection with, the, with what they see. So if, um, what is this, uh, characteristics and social influence on the individual affect the way they gravitate towards the nature of the media content. So if you look back into the slides of, uh, Kevin, can you go back to slide 11 where Dexter and Kill Bill are? If you can. They can't see you, but they can hear me, so be quiet. <laughs> so, oh, the star is with you, Crystal. <laughs> Your yeah. little eight year old. I think you need to go forward. We're going backwards in the slides. Mm. Oh, no, no, oh, yeah, wanted no, to I'm, go back to the yeah. Oh, you wanted to go back. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So when, when children look at violence or anything, it's like, for example, if you look at Dexter, if you look, if you look at a logical like, way, um, he's a serial killer. He kills people in order to feed, like, his, I guess, what he says is dark ego or something like that. But when you look, if you look from a police perspective, he's just a, like a cold killer. He's just someone killing people for no reason from their point of view. But the show, it takes from the perspective of Dexter, who he says, I like he has like evil urges and he wants to like I guess murder people but he kills people for a good reason he kills people who already do evil deeds so that captures the attention of children and even like adults he was like okay that's pretty cool it justifies why he's doing evil things kill bill uh, the the lady I forgot her, her character name but 
she's killing them. I'm pretty sure for revenge. I, I, I've mm-hmm. never seen the movie a long time ago, but she kill, she kills a lot of people for revenge. So that justifies why she does like the violence. And Grand Theft Auto is just you know Grand Theft Auto like because it's like playing that. <laughs> uh, you can go back to my slides, Kevin. Thank uh-huh. you. But basically, in for moderators of violence for in media, children will connect with any kind of violence that basically go like un without punishment. Um, if you look at like comic book, like um, Batman, he's a vigilante. He technically is doing crime by facing crime himself, but he justifies it as bringing justice that the government can't do. So with that, children are like, okay, that's okay. Uh, next slide, Kevin. So when it says, uh, what catches attention in media and in effects, characters who commit violent acts without receiving any punishment increase the act of violence in children. Showing violence as a justified action stimulates aggression in the long run. Children who encounter violence are more likely to become more aggressive. So <clears throat> to an extent, it's true. So in the long term, media violence exposure is stronger in young children. They are more, they're more gullible. They're more impressionable. In the short term, stronger is stronger for older children. Um, like if you look at uh news and stuff, um, the media violence, uh, like school shootings is not like little children can do that, but they will probably grow into becoming aggressive. But if you look at a like, school shooting, it's mostly high school students who are impressionable really quick. And it's, it's really dangerous. Uh, this aggressiveness is equally in both men and women. And it shows that IQ does not protect uh, in any adolescent from becoming more aggressive from media violence. Uh, next slide, Kevin. So we could talk about media of media violence and how to basically like uh, calm down the aggressive. So discussing what is socially acceptable can help decrease aggressive behavior. So as Crystal did with her, her daughter, which is a really good experiment. Um, she saw that her daughter was becoming more, like she loved the, like, like I guess she wanted to run over people, fictional people on the game. But after discussing with her daughter saying that what is not socially acceptable, like what is and what isn't, her daughter was able to, you know, comprehend and was like, okay, what, what can I do and what can I not do? Um, being able to distinguish, distinguish schemas can lead to hostile and non-hostile behavior when it comes to predicting other intentions. So um, sometimes you look like you look walking the streets and someone's staring at you that automatically like makes you like a little bit annoyed. It's like, why are you looking at me like that? Uh, you gotta able to distinguish, uh, distinguish what who's gonna harm you and who's gonna not but only par- like parents and their children can do that um from the environment that you're growing up in and then i said yeah as i said parents will, uh contributes to the development of aggressiveness in the child um yeah it's basically that <laughs> next slide So we're gonna see the some positive effects of media violence. You know, we don't want to focus so much on negativity. Um, it's bad. Uh, so, but on young children, uh, we can use educational content on TV that is associated positively with I think, uh, academic outcomes. So I remember when I was a child, I guess when I was like in preschool, we used to use like a little gaming thing called like something with a frog, and there we learn how to do math and English and writing. So you could use that as media, like media violence whatever. Uh, children connect with media characters and connect can be used to enhance education. Like PBS Kids, that's a great, basically positive way to use media to influence the children. Us leapfrog, thank you. <laughs> um, teens and adolescents, uh, demanding games that require time and focus can help improve motor, cognitive, and professional skills. So yeah, um, adolescents, they play, well, what, what do they play online? Call of Duty, uh, what are Warcraft and other games? Um, honestly, they might they might include violence or they might not. But um, the more it's kind of like the game, if it focuses on like an actually using skill, people, the uh, the children or adolescents, like teenagers, develop like professional skills. They're clicking. They're more focused. They're more aware, 
and it's you know it's a thing that many people don't even focus on or look at it was like oh it's just they're spending too much time on video games but um it helps them develop focusing and making more ideas and stuff and also they can build friendships as kevin stated before that when you're playing online with other people um you, you have the opportunity to talk to other people as well you get to connect with others and stuff look at media like when you're on facebook uh snapchat yeah action and adventure uh, when you're on Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, Twitter, whatever, it connects you to people outside of the world, and that's how you meet more people. Um, so, yeah. And then physical games, you know, the new VR games that they have, or the arcade games, the Dance Dance Revolution. Games that require physical usage can help improve executive function, dancing, Guitar Hero, Wii games. And it brings people together as well when you're having, like, a family dinner. They usually connect what Wii or... Nintendo DS or what do you do? No, the Switch, I think that's what it's called. It brings, uh, it connects people. So it's always nice to look at the positive. And next slide. Okay. I think that's yep. just the recap. Yep, this is the class yeah. discussion now. Class discussions. Okay, guys, so our first question is, are there any positive effects, do you guys think, to playing violent video games? after hearing both the uh, negatives and positives to media in general? Or just like your personal beliefs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So anybody? Open class discussions? Also well, you guys did a great job. Thank you so much, Crystal, for introducing to us your little experiment, homemade experiment. And I hope the star <laughs> of your experiment is watching. And King, you want to answer the first question? Oh, uh, Professor, quick question. Should I yeah. stop? Should I stop the recording now? That's okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well. Can you go back to the question so that we can get oh, yeah. reminded? Mm -hmm. yeah, just keep it up. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Just give me a second. Mm -hmm. But uh, King, what were you going to say? I don't think there's any positive effects uh, in playing uh, violent video games or kids playing violent video games, period. I mean, think about it. Mm -hmm. If it is something like the leapfrog thingy that you use to teach children how to read or how to do math, that brings positive effects into the child. But if you're talking about something like Grand Theft Auto, which is so violent, what do you think a child is going to learn from that? Learn how to shoot somebody and go a, a carjack somebody? Let's think about it. There's no positive effect at all in playing uh, for kids playing uh, violent video games, period. That is just my personal objection. Mm -hmm. what do others think i think for kids i understand that like young children don't need to be playing that but i think it all has to do with like age and maturity like i didn't start playing video games when i was young but i feel like once you reach a certain age and maturity level then at that point you know what's right you know what's wrong you know this is just a game and at that point, maybe like if you're frustrated or whatever, you just want to play a game, then you play a game. But children wise, I don't think it's beneficial to them because they haven't reached that maturity level yet. Yeah, but also some kids mature faster than others due to what's yeah. going on in their household too. So, I mean, it all, it depends on a matter of how well you know your child and if you're willing to let them play that type of game, any type of game whether it's violent, yeah. not violent, whatever, it's a matter of also like talking to your kids. So they're typically, it's like the parents that don't really pay attention to what their kids are doing and don't pay attention to the like signs that are coming through. Yeah. That actually end up acting on certain things like these. But otherwise, if they're not, if you're talking to them and you let them know the difference and everything and you're, you know, like understanding what they like and then you're also conversating about it, I think it's perfectly fine. Anyone else? <clears throat> um, just to, uh, oh wait, is my mic even being on right now? No, we could hear yeah, you. Mm -hmm. You're good. All we right, can so, all um, hear you. Okay. Um, just to add on to what Tripti said, like most of the games, like Grand Theft Auto, are supposed to be 
they have ratings and they're usually mm-hmm. rated towards mature audiences anyways. Kids aren't supposed to be playing those types of games because that's not who it's targeted for. Mm-hmm. But then we again, know. like uh, another issue with that is that, again, some parents don't really pay attention to, to that because yeah. uh, like from personal experience with my little brother, he, I don't know if you guys know Five Nights at Freddy's, yeah, like that is yeah. the most terrifying game in the world and my brother can play it like like a normal person just like sometimes i think he's inside the call because he's <laughs> normal. Nice to it. Yeah. but it's rated like uh i googled it and it's rated 15 for violence strong horror and frightening images and he's nine and he and he just like he sees the jump scares and everything but like i i kept a close eye on that because i'm like the moment he starts like acting it out that's it it's over because try to get him out of the computer it's impossible to do that like he starts having a tantrum he's this and that because he's he's so attached and he um got attached to that mostly because my mom is working my dad is working i'm at school sometimes my brother he he just goes to school and then comes back plays the video game i'm doing homework my grandparents don't even pay attention to him, so that's kind of like his his safe haven, and we don't really pay attention to that. So even though the ratings are there, and like they they don't really you know pay attention to it, it's there as disclosure, so there won't be like lawsuits and stuff. But it's really up to the parents and up to the guardians to to pay a close attention to it, so it won't escalate to a a higher um, degree of severity. So. That's my personal aspect of it in terms of it being like a positive effect of playing violent video games. I don't think there is. It's just for entertainment, but it, it gets carried away. I think it, there should be more productive things that like kids should be playing. But then again, like we're over here playing violent video games. I just downloaded Cuphead and I got addicted. So it's like, you know. <laughs> Good well, the other thing is. <laughs> Another thing is that, like, when you think about it, the video games that we have, like, for example, like, on PS4 or whatever, it's, uh, how can I explain it? It's like, it's gonna, I don't know if it's gonna sound dumb, this is the first thing that came to mind, but, like, you have, like, the healthy chips, and then you have, like, Doritos, like, Doritos are addicting, that's what, like, you like, whereas, like, violent video games, that's what's fun, like, that's what's, like, it like makes you it gives you a rush and you're like running and shooting and this and that compared to playing like rocket league where you're like kicking a soccer ball around so i mean like if there's other i mean i don't know but like if there's other games that are just as stimulating maybe like it would be less of a problem but i know all of the quote like fun games are the violent games so just that it's just all games have some oh, type of yeah. like if you really think about it, all video games nowadays have some type of violence in it. Yeah. Because I guess that's what people okay. see well as like fun, you know. Well I think what's what's seen as fun yeah, is the, the, the fact that it's like a fantasy. Like, oh you'll never be able to do that, but like yeah. you can do it online. So I can shoot people online and not get in trouble in that and I get rewarded with a win or something. Mm-hmm and leveling up compared to something like Rocket League or I don't know like Animal Crossing I don't know why a lot of people are into that now <laughs> but it's like, <laughs> something as compelling as like from my experience I, I find Cuphead as like the most like frustrating game in my life but the moment I clear a, like a level I'm just like that's it I'm, I'm done with life kind <laughs> of that's that's an accomplishment for me so it's, I, I understand that that um, like the violent fantasy type of games they're the ones that that draw in most of the attention well and the developers they know what they're doing because (laughs) they understand the human brain they know we all need dopamine especially in times where we need more reward and we are isolated or we are not supervised from anyone being our boss being our parents being our nasty old sister who wants to become a criminal uh lawyer (laughs) we just escape from the mundane world to create you know some kind of fantasy world where we can actually become a different avatar but if we overdo it and and heidi you mentioned and crystal you mentioned too 
kids especially are very vulnerable to these games and they become attached. And if you want to take away the game from them, they throw tantrums because you can see something like a disruptive behavior in their everyday life that they cannot actually, you know, pass the day without playing that game. So there must, there might be some kind of addiction. I think that's because they get like that adrenaline rush, that stimulation from it, which like leads to their second question. Like, is there something else? I mean, when you like involve your children in sports at a young age or in an activity at a young age and they get that rush out of that activity, of course, they're going to be less likely to just be stuck on a violent video game that gives them that rush. So I feel like there is a way like once you just you build you build habits at a young age, you build your qualities at a young age. So it's important for parents, mothers, whoever to start it from when children are young, like keep them involved, make them go outside because then they're going to find, like I remember in Born for Love, they were talking about, you're going to find what you need wherever. Like if you don't get it somewhere, if you don't get it in your house, you're going to go find your attention in a game. You're going to go find it somewhere else. So, I mean, it's important to give them what they need in the proper way at a young age. Mm -hmm. So, Crystal, how about your daughter? Like, how do you build the balance or any parent out there? Because nobody likes broccoli, right? And broccoli is really the, the violent game. <laughs> the majority of people, nobody likes broccoli. Come on. Guys. I love broccoli. It's called broccoli? What are you talking about? <laughs> we know tricks that make our parents love broccoli. Like, yummy. Mm, we need to eat it. But at the end of the day, I'm honest, I don't like broccoli. Sorry, Crystal, is your child listening? No, no. Okay, good, good, good. <laughs> you love broccoli, right? <laughs> if you tell to an eight-year-old or 10-year-old. But we need to find a way to make games and especially bring like adventure and fun and the adrenaline rush into more like a, a chocolatey game. So how can we really design games that are safe and still bring that action that that Tripti and, and Evan love in that game. And even Heidi, she now confessed that she gets addicted <laughs> to the violin at some sort. Well, re regarding the second question to, are there any alternatives to deter children from playing violent video games? That's why I have the reference there um, after that bullet, because that's actually where I found a article that suggests that um, parents can co-play with children in order to um, both monitor children's access to inappropriate content, as well as provide another form of socializing with their children through bonding. Of course, the games would not be violent, but because we live in modern you know, society, um, gaming is a part of it. So it did do a study for parents who co-played with their children on just non-violent video games and they were actually positive effects so they use like an entertainment sophomore rating board system which uh gives the parents a, an ideal of what was age appropriate for their children to play play in and for the parents to also play with them and they were all there were it was a, a meta analysis so it would there were all effects were positive so they even discover that when children went over to their friend's house where they were less uh being watched over so to speak they did not play violent video games even when the parents weren't there like watching over their shoulder they were disclosed in their rooms with their friends over their friend's house and they still instead chose to play the same games that they played with their parents So reactions? <laughs> one way, like <laughs> parents can study. Say, yeah. reaction, guys? I don't want to overrule your reactions. Any reactions? Well, I think first and foremost, um, children should not be exposed to violent games, period. I don't mean to sound like a father of all father, but I've never exposed my son to vid uh, violent video games. Uh, at 12 years old, he still plays his basketball or uh, games and things of that nature so he would take he would take a break from reading his book and he would go and play that for about a few few seconds and goes back to reading his book so i, I guess 
it depends on the parents. But nowadays, you have these parents who were raised on playing violent video games, raising their children. They, ex they expose their children to that. You know, I, we expect our children to pick up things here and there when they go outside, outside of our homes. But if you, as a parent, you stay home and then you show your child how to play this, or you're playing this a violent video game and you think your child is not watching you, oh, believe me, that child will pick it up. So just don't expose your child to that violent video game if you don't want your child to pick that up in the first place. And I think that's the, pre uh, that's the preventative measure. But I think the study's interesting in that it's parents playing with their children and it's non-violent video games. And then when they go out, they're not playing violent video games because I guess they're used to, I guess, when they play with their parents, they get a good experience out of it. So it's interesting that when they go out, they still follow the same rules. Yes. Children learn what you teach them. Children yeah. learn what they're exposed to. So if you expose them to that violent game, so believe me, they're going to do that. They're going to play, they're going to think it's okay to play that vi uh, violent video games when they go to their friends' houses or when they're somewhere else when, when, when there is uh, no adult supervision. Mm -hmm. But if you don't expose them to that, oh, believe me, they will behave themselves. I, I, I agree with you, King. I, I think, I mean, my opinion, I'm not going to tell you my opinion, but let me ask you another question. I understand where you're coming from and where everybody else is coming from. But do you think violent games are causing real world violence? That's a good question. It, I think that it contributes it to it. Yeah, it definitely contributes to it because um, there's other um, factors to consider. But it's it definitely should be looked at. It shouldn't be uh, taken as small or less than or not as important. But it definitely contributes to um, violence in the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Charisma. It's, it's just seen. Yeah, it's seen everywhere. It's not just in video games. It's seen literally everywhere. You can be on Instagram and see a violent fight that where people are killed or, uh, you know, where there's bodily harm and it's literally everywhere. You can't, it's almost hard to escape it. We have to be careful. We haven't really, science hasn't really established a clear link between watching or playing violent games and becoming a mass shooter. Mm -hmm. There's no link. It might contribute and, and heighten the, the taste, right. the favor, you know, the preference right. to do more aggression, but it doesn't mean that we are creating a mass shooter. We have right. to also consider other factors, such as Crystal, you mentioned in your um, earlier slides, <laughs> isolation. <laughs> Isolation. Yeah, social isolation. Mm -hmm. Actually, this morning I woke up to a horrific news from home. Um, it was in the news, and my brother and my sister knew this particular victim. She was slaughtered. She was rejecting this one guy for years, and he kept uh, asking her to marry him. And one night he just burst in into the dormitory where she was actually a hostess to uh, to the dorm at 10 p.m last night he shot at her twice and she didn't die and then he just took out his knife and just 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 cut her throat and it's like how is this possible mm -hmm. i mean this is like and and this is happening in a very small town where my siblings grew up i'm the only one who was born in germany but they grew up in that small town and they know this particular, uh, you know, woman who is just dead right now because, and, and the question is, who's this guy? What, what made him, what made mm -hmm. him cause, do, I mean, what, co what caused him to become such a, such a horrific, violent person? Uh, he's on the run. Yeah. He, they're, they're trying, I mean, 
it's like it's a small town in the Caucasus. It's like you never hear anything and people mm -hmm. only talk about their cows. <laughs> you know, it's like it's unheard of. It's been and I think this this shelter in place, this isolation, this social isolation, this pandemic right now is really causing us weird, weird fantasies. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't think he's into video gaming or anything. I don't know anything about him. He's just a 36 year old man, but it's just like so horrific. And I don't know this particular victim, but my brother and my sister, they knew her from their childhood. They're just devastated. How could this happen in a small town? Like it won't be in the news because it's such a small town. <laughs> you will even not hear it, but it's just like, how can you go and cut her throat? because she doesn't want you. My opinion on like the whole violence in the world in video games, I mean, I don't know enough and I don't think there's enough research to say that video games causes world violence. I mean, I may be wrong, but like look at it when we're reading the book, like there's that whole book is about empathy and there's so many cases that show a lack of empathy and video games was just one chapter so I think the problem regarding violence is people not having empathy and that is caused by so many different things video games yeah causes it but that's one of so many mm -hmm. different things and then when you pair different things together like playing video games and always being isolated and not having a support family and you add all of this together, it's like unable to decipher what causes the violence, you know? Mm -hmm. Did you guys look at my pre-recorded lecture? No. Yeah. Yeah, I put some statistics there and actually it's a billion dollar industry. And um, let's look at it together. But I, I think I need to stop this recording. Yep. Yeah. Oh, okay. So I can show you my, <laughs> but thank you so much. Applause guys for the beautiful um, presentation and Crystal, you rock. Thank you guys. I mean, the, the, 